So I'm continuing the series today uh, with my talk on Dorflinger's presidential glass. Now this is an area where we have a great deal of scholarship that's been done over the years. Uh, Jane Spillman, who was the curator of American Glass at the Corning Museum of Glass for many, many years, uh, did a wonderful exhibit on uh, presidential glass. And she borrowed pieces from the White House collection. I think the Corning Museum cleaned those pieces. Uh, they did a special exhibit showcasing uh, different uh, examples of Dorflinger's pres or uh, of the, all the companies who did uh, presidential glass, along with the uh, the China with place settings. And then uh, Jane did a book on. Uh, presidential glass that still, I think, serves as the foundational uh, piece of uh, uh, scholarship in uh, looking at uh, the glass that has been made by a number of companies over the years uh, for, the, uh, for the White House and for different presidential administrations. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Feller wrote three articles on Dorflinger's presidential glass. Uh, David Dorflinger, uh, who uh, uh, whose father, John Dorflinger, saved many of the, uh, the pieces uh, that were left over when the factory closed, uh, also did an, an excellent article on Dorflinger's presidential glass for the ACORN, the publication of the uh, uh, Sandwich Glass Museum on Cape Cod. So the literature is pretty replete. Most of it is pretty good. Uh, there are a few things that we've learned more about over the years, and so I've titled my talk A Reappraisal of Dorflinger's Presidential Glass, and I'll try to highlight as we go through some of the new, newer things that we've learned uh, over time about the contributions that Dorflinger has, uh, has made uh, in terms of providing uh, glass to the White House. I'm going to start, though, before, just one step before the Dorflinger uh, contributions. Uh, this is a relatively recent acquisition by the museum. It is a wine rinser from the Franklin Pierce service. Now, President and Mrs. Pierce visited the Crystal Palace exhibition in New York in 1853, uh, and following their visit, they ordered a new set of china and a new set of glasswork glassware from Howitt and Daly, one of the leading uh, uh, cut, or cut glass and porcelain uh, distributors and retailers in New York City. Uh, and this is an example of a wine rinser from the Pierce service. Now, wine rinsers were used up until about 1860. Uh, and you used a wine rinser because you would typically be given one wine glass and in between courses, this would have water in it, and you would rinse the wine glass out in the wine rinser and then reuse the same glass again. After about 1860, you had the multiple wine glasses that we are more familiar with today, and these wine rinsers went out of fashion. And as you look at this piece, you can see the presidential coat of arms here, the US coat of arms with the eagle, and you can see the style of glassware. So it's relatively thick, and it's done with these heavy flutes, relatively deep cut heavy flutes around the, uh, around the bottom of the, of the wine rinser. So very much uh, in the style that was popular in New York in the 1850s. A little bit heavier, simpler designs, lots of use of heavy flute patterns uh, and designs uh, in glassware of this time. So this is very representative of what the Pierces would have seen on exhibit at the Crystal Palace exhibition when they went into the Howitt and Daly uh, booth. Here's a little more close-up view of the U.S. coat of arms with the eagle. Interesting in, the, uh, in this example, so the eagle is standing on the shield. There are 13 stars on the shield, and there are the stripes. Uh, uh, in the eagle's left-hand talon, uh, you've got um, uh, a um, piece is... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Olive branch. Olive, uh, yeah, an olive branch, or and then on the oh, right hand, or yeah, and then on the right hand side, 
uh, a palm frond, which is kind of unusual, and we'll see the change as time goes on in the future. And then on the banner, E Pluribus Unum, uh, out of many one. This is another example in the museum's collection uh, of a piece that is identical to a decanter in the Pierce service. It doesn't have the U.S. coat of arms on it, but it has the grape leaf engraved decorations. And again, this flute style, uh, again, very representative of uh, glassware being made in New York in the 1850s. And there's another example identical to uh, a large decanter in the White House collection from the Pierce service, again, with these flute panels, almost like the Ashburton press glass pattern, uh, panels below, panels above. Uh, and uh, again, fairly simple in its style, a little heavy in the, uh, in the glassware. When you're doing these flutes, you're cutting away a fair amount of the glass, and so the glass has to be relatively thick. Now, we think that the best identification of the, uh, the maker of the Pierce service is the Brooklyn Flint Glass Company. Uh, they were well established in New York in the 1850s. Brooklyn Flint Glass exhibited at the 1851 Crystal Palace Exhibition in London. They also exhibited uh, at the Crystal Palace Exhibition in 1853 uh, in New York. Uh, and it is, they are, we think, the most likely candidate uh, for uh, being the maker of the, um, of the Pierce service. Now, in Jane Spellman's book, Jane attributed these pieces to um, the uh, Andrew Jackson administration, but we think that what Jane was doing in her scholarship was focusing very heavily on the inventories rather than taking a step back and looking at the shape and the form of the glassware. And if you look at Pittsburgh glass from the 1830s to 40, uh, it tends to be of a very different style than the more modern feeling New York pieces that were done in the 1850s. So we don't think there are very many, if any, survivors from the, uh, the Jackson service, uh, but there are survivors from the Pierce service. And we think that the best attribution uh, is to the Brooklyn Flint Glass Company, which was the predecessor later on of the Corning Glass Works. But with that as a backdrop, uh, now I want to turn to Dorflinger's contributions. Now, uh, George and Helen McKeeran, father and daughter, uh, wrote uh, a, an excellent book in the early 1940s on uh, glassware, glass made in America. And they touched on many of the companies within the industry. But there's very little mention in the book of Dorflinger glass. And so William Dorflinger Jr. wrote to George and Helen, uh, and he was complaining a bit about the fact that Dorflinger really hadn't received the recognition and the representation in their book that he thought they should have. And one of the things he wanted to point out is that every White House set from Lincoln's time to President Harding's was made by the Dorflinger firms. Uh, and I think that really sets the stage for the discussion that we'll have now about the many contributions that Dorflinger made to glassware in the, uh, in the White House. And as we go through, I think one of the things you'll see is how revolutionary the Dorflinger designs were at every step of the way. They were really leading the way in terms of changing fashions uh, within, the, uh, within society, in terms of the styles that most appealed to, uh, to the public and to uh, wealthy individuals and to places like the White House. So keep in mind the Pierce set and how those pieces were designed and, and made. And now we'll start to look at some of the Dorflinger ones. And the first Dorflinger service was made for the Lincoln White House in 1861. And here you see an example of the China service that Mary Todd Lincoln ordered. Uh, it has this really interesting purple called Solferino band and then with a chain border around the outside of the, uh, of the pieces, and then with an eagle, a large eagle in the center of the plate. 
And the glassware, as you can see, and we're going to look at a lot of pieces in more detail, you can see this glassware is very different from the Pierce service. The glassware is much thinner, it's much lighter, and the cutting and the engraving work is much more delicate. This was a fundamental change from the glassware that everyone had been used to as they looked at New York, New York glassware, and for that matter from New England as well, in the 1850s. So you see fine diamond cutting around the bottom of the bowl, a roll, row of oval cuts directly above the fine diamond cutting, and then a beautiful engraved border around the top. And here we have a water goblet, a large wine glass, a smaller wine glass, and then a, or a cordial, and then a, a champagne glass. And we'll look at some of these pieces now in more detail. Uh, but here is a copy of the invoice for the, um, the Lincoln service. Uh, we think this service also was ordered through what uh, had been Howitt and Daly, and now the name of the company was E.V. Howitt, again, one of the leading China and glass uh, retail firms uh, in New York. Uh, and here we have a description of the presidential service. And you can see in the center right there, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln says this bill is correct, so it's ready to be paid. And then on what the back the side, yeah, pardon? Sorry. Yeah. Where was the amount and what did it cost? Um, so, 1500. yeah, $1,500, exactly. Yep. Yeah. For how much? We don't know how many pieces were in that set. We're assuming it was about 500 pieces. Yeah. But the number of pieces were, uh, weren't enumerated. And then here you have Lincoln's signature basically saying uh, this is approved to be paid. Uh, for many years, this had been uh, at Ford's Theater, and unfortunately, it's disappeared. Okay. Confirmation that uh, how it was the, uh, uh, the seller of not only of the china, but the glassware. Uh, and the relationship with Dorflinger is found in this note. Uh, and Hank Loftus found this in June Hardy's uh, collection of materials that she left to the Dorflinger Glass Museum. Uh, it's just a wonderful note from Howitt to Mrs. Dorflinger, and they are sending her a card receiver, so a little dish that would have been used to leave your greeting cards, and it was done in the Union service, so from the the China set uh, for the Lincoln White House, uh, and they're providing, they're giving this to Mrs. Dorflinger uh, as a token of uh, their appreciation. So shows the uh, the how it link uh, to Dorflinger uh, and the source of uh, Dorflinger as the glass service that how it then <laughs> provided to the White House. So a great piece of uh, documentation that helps round out the picture and something that we really didn't have until what about three or four years ago. Okay. The Lincoln service was not made here in White Mills. It was produced in 1861. So it was made in Dorflinger's Greenpoint factory, the Greenpoint Flint Glass Works, right on Newtown Creek at the upper edge of what <coughs> now separates Brooklyn and Queens. This is an engraving of a uh, business card for the, uh, the factory. Uh, and you can see this was the blowing shop on the left, the cutting shop here and housing for his workers over here. And because it was right on Newtown Creek, uh, you had excellent transportation to bring in raw materials and get your, and send out your, uh, your finished goods as well. One of the other interesting things you'll see here, you'll see two names, C. Dorflinger and N.S. Bailey. Nathaniel Bailey was Dorflinger's partner in the Greenpoint factory. How did they pack the glass? They packed it in wooden barrels and in excelsior, so wooden curlicues, shredded wood, and that way that kept the pieces from banging against each other, uh, and you could ship them by ship, or when the factory moved out here, by rail or by canal, uh, and uh, it would keep the glass from being damaged. Okay, some more examples of the Lincoln service. Here you see a great view of the, chi the state uh, China pattern, China service here uh, that Mary Lincoln ordered. Uh, you also see two wonderful examples of the Lincoln service. Here is a large comport 
probably the largest piece in the service. And then here uh, is a hock wine, made for white wine in solid cranberry color in the bowl, uh, and then with a colorless glass stem and, uh, and foot. Here's a close up of the um, US coat of arms on the Lincoln service. So the coat of arms was included in this shield. So you have two lines uh, making the shield and then the coat of arms is inside it. Uh, and you'll see a few differences. We'll compare the two a little bit later on to the, uh, to the Pierce uh, service, but the design is really pretty similar. They're very, very quite close. There we go. Okay. Three more pieces. Celery vase here. Uh, and again, all of these pieces have the U.S. coat of arms on them. Uh, notice the design on the foot of the celery vase. On most all of the large serving pieces uh, and also on a few of the stemware pieces as well, you have this design for the foot, which is a large star and then with smaller fans or rays in between the large star. Uh, and that uh, design has been nicknamed by Helen Barger, a longtime early Dorflinger collector, uh, the Brooklyn Star, very characteristic of glass made in New York during the 1850s and 1860s. And Dorflinger used that uh, in many of the pieces in the Lincoln service. Here's a finger bowl right here. There we are. Uh, you notice that this one is cracked. These are all from the White House service. And then an ice cream plate. And this one does not have the shield around the U.S. coat of arms on the, uh, on the ice cream plate. What makes that an ice cream plate? Uh, just the size and the shape. And you know that's what it was used for. And it's about the size of a dessert plate. Other examples from the White House collection, uh, a court decanter with a very distinctive shape that you see in the Lincoln service, another finger bowl, a large wine, a cordial, and then the, uh, the punch cup. And here again, you can see the punch cup has the tra traditional Brooklyn star foot, but we'll see a variation on most of the other stemware pieces. Here's a water carafe, and also uh, another decanter without the stopper, also from the White House collection as well. Here, other pieces from the White House collection, the um, uh, pint decanter, the smaller one, the quart decanter, the larger one, water carafe, wine glass, and then the punch cup as well. Punch cups are extremely rare. Uh, the first set got broken fairly quickly uh, and after that, the White House decided not to spend the money to reorder more of, the, of these designs. So we only know of two, three, two, yep, that we know of uh, that have survived to this point. And one of them is at the Dorflinger uh, Glass Museum at the top of the hill. They're so tall. They, they are, yeah, relatively tall. And punch cups had a rough life anyway, so, yeah. Did the, did the, yeah. the handle affect? I probably and also probably just dropping them, <laughs> yes. banging them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two examples uh, that we had on display last year uh, as part of our exhibit of presidential glass on the left hand side, the small wine glass and on the right hand side, the saucer champagne. And here you get a, a good view of the basics of the design. So you see the fine diamond cutting around the bottom of the bowl, uh, this almost tulip shape uh, cutting around the base of the bowl itself where the bowl meets the stem, uh, the teardrop shape of the stem, and then uh, the cutting on the foot as well, and then the ivy engraved border around the top, and then the coat of arms with the, uh, with the shield. Uh, and that's pretty consistent through all of the stemware. Now I'm gonna show you uh, some different views of the foot, uh, but the foot on these pieces is really interesting. Okay, now we're going back to look at the presidential coat of arms on the Pierce service. So if you look at it, it's pretty similar 
to the Lincoln service, but there are a few little differences. So the eagle is looking up. You have, again, the, uh, the palm frond here, uh, and, uh, and, and you don't have arrows. You have the stars on the shield. When you look at the Lincoln one, now this is more traditional. You've got arrows for war in the left talon, of uh, peace on the right. Uh, you don't have stars on the top of the shield. Uh, you have the same banner, very, very close. And the only difference is the wings and the head on the eagle are pretty well straight across, uh, not looking up quite as much. But pretty clear that uh, what Dorflinger was doing is looking at the U.S. coat of arms on the Pierce service, modifying a little bit, but did something that was very, very similar. But that's also what tripped up Jane. Yeah. Because the peer service is yeah. the Jackson engraving. Exactly, exactly. So you had a pretty consistent coat of arms all the way through in these early years, but you have to step back and look at the glass itself and ask you what it's telling you about the right period. Uh, here's a view of the engraving on the champagne, the saucer champagne. Uh, again, nice view of the, uh, uh, of the U.S. coat of arms on that piece. Now, here's the foot. If you look at this foot, it almost looks like a bird's foot. And if you remember the Brooklyn star, here are the large rays of the star, and then here are the fans. But what Dorflinger did on these stemware pieces is he widened out the base of the star, and as a result, he pushed the fans forward and so you end up with this very distinctive design that really does look like a bird's foot. And you see this for the first time on the Lincoln service. Later on, Dorflinger actually carried this design over into other pieces as well that he produced after uh, making the Lincoln service. But this is where you see that design for the first time. And it's really a modification of the Brooklyn Star. Some more examples. Now, there were reorders of the Lincoln service, several reorders over time, last one being uh, in the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Some of those were done by Dorflinger, but some of them were done by other companies as well. And William Dorflinger Jr. identified this one, these apple green ones, as being made by the New England Glass Company and not by Dorflinger. And if you look at the design, it's a little different. So first of all, you don't have the double-lined shield around the eagle. And second, you don't have the banner. The banner is gone as well. And third, the foliage is a little bit different uh, as well. So when New England did their reorder, they modified the, uh, uh, the engraving design. I actually think the Dorflinger engraving uh, is a little bit finer and, uh, and more detailed. But here again, you've got uh, color wine uh, and also the stem and the foot are in color on those New England Glass Company pieces as well. Uh, so you have a hock wine in color here, saucer champagne goblet, dessert wine, uh, a uh, hock wine in cranberry, and then a small, uh, uh, probably a cordial as well. These are interesting pieces. So this pair of vases was made for a man named Russell Alger. And if you look at these, they are identical to the Lincoln service. So they have the fine diamond cutting, the ovals, they have the Brooklyn star foot. So just like if you looked at the celery vases for the Lincoln service, they have the same engraved ivy border and they have the U.S coat of arms on them, which is really unusual since he wasn't president of the United States. But Russell Alger uh, was a Michigan timber baron. He was a major general in the Union Army during the Civil War. He later, he was the governor of Michigan. He was the 1888 Republican presidential candidate, and he was President McKinley's Secretary of War, uh, and he was also a U.S. Senator. So he had a successful business career and then a very long and successful political career. Uh, he was married in April 1861. 
He also undoubtedly went to the White House during the course of the Civil War and probably saw the Lincoln service there. Uh, so we suspect what happened is he ordered this set of vases from Dorflinger and he wanted them just exactly like the Lincoln service, but on the back side, there's his monogram on the two pieces. So what does that say? Uh, it is uh, Russell, and I think it's M. Alger, R. M. A. Oh, A. A. Uh, Russell. A. Alexander. A. Al yeah, Alger. Yeah, there we are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So these are in the Detroit Institute of Art because of the Michigan connection. Uh, and they're the only pieces we've found that are non presidential pieces, but that have the U.S. coat of arms on them. So kind of an interesting uh, example of a use of the Lincoln design, complete use of the Lincoln design, uh, but for someone who was, uh, uh, who was not part of the Lincoln service. Uh, we suspect, again, uh, given his role in the Civil War, his position in the military, that's why he wanted them, and that's why uh, uh, they were made for him. But Dorflinger also used the same basic design of the Lincoln service for other people as well. This service must have gotten a lot of attention and a lot of notoriety. It was a very popular service. It was used as the state service in the White House for 30 years, from 1861 until 1891. And so many people we think probably wanted glassware just like the president had. And so we've found a number of other pieces. So some of them, like this water goblet, are identical to the Lincoln service, including the engraving, but no U.S. coat of arms. The wine glass next to it, again, identical in the engraving and in the cutting and in the design and in the shape to the Lincoln service, but this one has a monogram on it as well. So in some instances, private individuals ordered glassware like the presidential service with their monograms. In other instances, you had pieces made by Dorflinger without the, uh, the monogram as well. A little hard to see, but there's an example of the water goblet. Again, very distinctive foot, the same foot you see on the Lincoln service, same shape on the, uh, on the stem as well. And then here's an example of the, of the wine glass with the monogram. You also see it in other pieces. So here is a whiskey decanter uh, or whiskey jug. This is uh, on exhibit upstairs. Same ivy engraved border. This is a nice view of the ivy engraved border. Fine diamond cutting, the oval cutting right above it. And this was also made uh, for someone. It has the, the shield for a monogram on the front. And there's the monogram, an H. So we see quite a few pieces uh, that we call Lincoln lookalikes uh, in the same pattern, in the same design, but without the, the presidential coat of arms and some with monograms and some without. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, set of decanters upstairs uh, in the Ray Laternus collection uh, that also are done in the same cutting as the, uh, the Lincoln service, but without the, uh, the engraving. This service is in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, and these pieces were all wrapped in newspaper. Uh, they're not in very attractive appearance right now, uh, but these photographs were taken a few years ago. And this is another example of a complete private service uh, with monograms, but done in the Lincoln style. So here you see a pair of celery vases and the yellow is from being wrapped up in newspaper for many years. So, excuse me, you reference Corning as cleaning certain pieces. Yeah. Did they get that off? Yeah, it can be cleaned off. And it could be, can be done by, there are a few very reputable private people who do that kind of work, although that group is shrinking, or some museums do as well. Corning does probably as good a job on conservation as any uh, place in the country. And in fact, one of our speakers at our Brilliant Weekend uh, Symposium in late September and October is the uh, former uh, conservator at the Corning Museum. Uh, I think one of the leading experts on the care 
uh, and restoration uh, of glass objects uh, in the world. So does that take a machine? It doesn't, but it takes like acids and chemicals mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. And what you don't want to do is affect the surface of the glass. So you try mild detergents first, and then you go to some acids if you need to, to get this stuff off. A newspaper is not a good thing to wrap glass in. Uh, so it, print yes, yeah. exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Some more examples from the VW service. So we don't know who this set was made for, but you've got the monogram there, VW, on the set. Uh, this is the celery vase looking down into it. Here's a comport. Can you go back to that down into it? Celery? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so here's the rim around the top. Uh, there's the cutting down below. It's all on the outside. The engraving's all on the outside as well. But you're looking just down into the celery vase from the top. Uh, comport, large comport, uh, very similar to the uh, Lincoln one that, uh, that we saw earlier. Two decanters with pouring spouts. That's a nice feature on these. And again, this is a very distinctive shape for decanters. You didn't see this shape uh, before this uh, in, the, uh, uh, in a lot of New York glassware. Instead, the decanters tended to be kind of squat and much thicker and much heavier. So in, in several respects, this design was, this service was quite revolutionary in terms of Dorflinger's design. Oval or, or triangular serving bowls. Again, you get a really good view of the Brooklyn Star base in, the, in these bowls. Here's some oval serving dishes, vegetable dishes as well. This is just a great service. Uh, water goblet, large wine, smaller wine or cordial. Yep. So it would be wonderful to see this service restored and actually see a table service done uh, with uh, a set of glassware uh, that would, would follow the, uh, the Lincoln service. So hopefully someday the uh, Museum of the City of New York will get the, these pieces cleaned and we'll think about displaying them. They, I don't think they've ever been out. They've just been on storage since the uh, museum received them. Okay, now we are going to move to the grant administration. Now for the state table service, uh, the grants used the Lincoln uh, State Service uh, as well. And so here you see examples of the Lincoln Service, again, water goblet, wine, uh, cordial, and uh, saucer champagne with the State China Service that Mrs. Grant ordered. Uh, this was an interesting new design. So a lot of the state China services that you see have that large traditional eagle in the center of the plate. But Mrs. Grant wanted American flowers. And so here you have this what was called a buff border. It's really kind of a yellow band with the presidential coat of arms here in kind of small uh, form on, in the band itself, and then with a large presentation of different American flowers in the design. Here's a, here's a rose, uh, and I think there were 17 different flowers in these designs. So if you went to the White House for a state occasion during the Grant um, administration, this is what you would have seen on the table. The Lincoln glassware and then the, uh, the new Grant State China Service. Now in 1874, the Grant's daughter Nellie mar married in the White House. She married an Englishman named Algernon Sartoris. Here's the happy couple. As it turned out, not so happy um, <laughs> over, uh, over time. Uh, but this became the major social event in the country uh, in 1874, the, the White House wedding uh, for Nellie Grant. And uh, for that wedding, the Grants ordered a new set of glassware from Dorflinger for their personal use. So for use at their daughter's wedding and also for their own personal use uh, in the White House. And because this set was made for their personal use, they paid for it themselves and it was theirs. And most of that set 
was taken by the Grants with them at the end of the, uh, of the Grants' second term in the White House. Here's an example of a saucer champagne glass, a cordial, water goblet, wine, and a hock wine for, uh, for white wine in, uh, in color. This service as well was really fairly revolutionary for 1874. So this is a little bit more modern design. It's a simple design, the hob star, hob star pattern, the hob diamond pattern, uh, but it has some features that tend to reflect a little bit more modern look forward with the uh, flash star foot. You can see it especially on the color wine glass, the cranberry wine glass, with the cranberry cut to clear foot uh, as well. That was really kind of a new, more modern feature to the design as well. So when Dorflinger did this set in 1874, he again was looking forward to a little bit more elaborate design and a little bit more modern feel to the glassware. So I think it's another good example of how Dorflinger was kind of leading the way in design work uh, and setting the trend and for taste in the, uh, in the country going forward. Okay, uh, Mrs. Grant in 1868 also ordered a set of china for their personal use. Uh, this was Chinese export porcelain in the rose medallion style. So you can see this very elaborate design of, uh, of Chinese porcelain, export porcelain uh, with these different scenes. Uh, and in the case of the Grant service, you have a center medallion with a USG cipher, with Grant's initials USG on them. And so this would have been used in the White House for uh, personal functions, uh, dining in the private, in the family dining room uh, for non-state occasions. And here's a luncheon plate. Uh, the silver in this case is Kirk's repoussé uh, pattern. And then you have the Grant glassware here. And so this is typically what you would have seen uh, being used in the, uh, the family dining room or for informal occasions with their own glassware and with their own uh, uh, export porcelain china. What's the year again? 1868 was when the, uh, uh, the, uh, the China service was ordered. The glassware, 1874. Okay, now the 1874 order on the glassware, you had President Grant's initials, just like you saw in the center medallion of the rose medallion plates. Here you have USG on the border of the glassware. And here is a cordial uh, from the early uh, 1874 order, and then a saucer champagne as well with the in engraved initials USG on them. Here's a little bit closer up view of the engraving with the initials. And here is a picture from the same service and you can see the USG engraved on the border up here at the top. And here it's a little more close up view. There's the USG engraved on the top. And then here is the cranberry cut to clear wine glass for white wine with the bowl and with the red cut to clear foot on the piece as well. This does not have the USG on them, but some of these pieces uh, from the original grant uh, order do have those. Uh, the grant order was first made in 1874. It was reordered in 1876 when President and Mrs. Grant visited the Philadelphia exhibition. Uh, David Dorflinger in his article uh, talks about a, a company ledger that he had for the company at the time. And the entry when this the reorder was ordered said uh, with the same uh, uh, cipher uh, as the original set. So that's how we know that you had the initials on the 1874 set and the 1876 reorder. There was a final reorder in 1880 after the Grants had left the, uh, the White House, we think that order did not have the initials engraved on the rim. Uh, that's why we see some of the Grant pieces without the, uh, without the initials. 
This decanter is an interesting one. Small pint decanter, cordial decanter. Uh, we don't have it out this year, uh, but we did have it out on display last year. Uh, Dorothy Daniels wrote uh, a, really a landmark book on American cut glass in the 1950s. She included examples and illustrations of a number of uh, pieces made uh, in the early years, through the middle years, and even in the later period as well. She shows uh, a decanter identical to this one and the White House collection. She attributed it to Gillender. It's not Gellander, it's Dorflinger. It was part of the, uh, the grant service that got left, uh, left behind. This decanter uh, came to us in the John and David Dorflinger collection, so an extra that matched the one that, uh, that is now in the, uh, in the White House. There's another example of how some of the literature isn't exactly right. And here's a view of the small pint decanter uh, with cordials. Okay, the Lincoln service, state service until 1891. Grant service for their personal use, grants at the end of their administration, took most of that glassware with them. In 1891, President Benjamin Harrison decided it was time to order a new state service for the White House. And here is an example of pieces from the Harrison service and also an example of the, uh, the Harrison China. We'll look at those a little bit more uh, in detail. So this again was another revolutionary design, very much in keeping with the new brilliant period of much more elaborate cut glass designs. Uh, it was time for something new and fresh at the White House. And again, once again, Dorflinger uh, provided the initial service. Here are examples of the china. Uh, Mrs. Harrison was a china painter, and so she was actively involved in the design of the new state porcelain service. And you can see that she wanted, again, an American theme. And so you see a combination of corn and goldenrod around the rims. Some of the pieces had the blue, the dark blue rims, and then some of the pieces uh, had the white, lighter white rims with the dark blue rim uh, just in, inside of it as well. So again, a nice American themed, more modern uh, China service to go with the new glassware service as well. And here's a wine glass from the Harrison service. Okay, now the coat of arms changed. So here you see the presidential coat of arms on the Harrison service. The eagle, here you've got the banner, E Pluribus Unum, in the eagle's beak. And down below, arrows in the left talon and the uh, uh, laurel leaves on the right hand and the, and the right talon as well. And your 13 stars in the shield above. This is not too different from the US coat of arms that we use today. And you can compare it to the Lincoln coat of arms, uh, really quite a departure a change from uh, what we'd seen in the past, but definitely a more modern feel to the new uh, coat of arms on the Harrison service. Here are examples of the Harrison service, a wine, a sherry, a cordial, saucer champagne, uh, and then a decanter. And wherever Dorflinger could, he finished these pieces with just a little extra in the design that really added uh, kind of the ultimate in terms of the design of the piece. So you'll see the feet of the stemware all had a more intricate and elaborate Hobstar foot, much more characteristic of the, the brilliant period that kicked off after the Philadelphia exhibition. And on the serving pieces, the decanters, you see this fine diamond ring, uh, the notching on the, uh, uh, on the, um, the edges of the, of the neck of the decanters as well. There we are. And some more examples, again, an ice cream plate, water carafe, finger bowl, uh, and a polyneris or a champagne tumbler, a brandy and soda tumbler back here, uh, and then a goblet. Were the ice cream plates always glass? 
Um, I think they were. You have ice cream sets during this period, mm -hmm. and they all had glass plates. Yeah, so you had a tray for the ice cream and then the individual plates. So when we go to porcelain plates, there weren't porcelain ice cream plates in these services mm -hmm. at the time. Then? Yes, yes. Typically served in a block, slice it, right. serve it on the plate. Yeah, yeah. Again, brandy and soda tumbler on the left. All of these are examples from the White House collection. Wine glass, saucer champagne, water goblet. Uh, this is, uh, we had this on loan last year, this saucer champagne glass uh, from the, uh, the Harrison service. Uh, it'll give you a good, more detailed view of the pieces. These pieces were all cut in the Russian pattern. Uh, the Russian pattern was first developed and patented by a man named uh, Philip McDonald, who worked for the Hawks Company in Corning in 1882. Uh, there was a seven-year term for the patent, so by 1889, the patent, the design was fair game. Anyone could use it, so Dorflinger was certainly free to use it in 1891 when this service was, uh, was made, and it was a very popular pattern uh, at the time. And why was it called Russian? It was called Russian because the original set of glassware made by the uh, by Hawks in that design was made for the Russian embassy, the U.S. embassy in Russia. Okay. Here's a close-up view of the uh, U.S. Uh, the presidential coat of arms uh, cut on the shield and then the, uh, uh, the Russian design. Here is the wine glass. This is in the museum's collection here. You'll notice the little paper label down here. Uh, that's the, uh, the factory paper label that Dorflinger put on the pieces that he uh, produced. And this piece still has the factory label on it. And then the, uh, the saucer, saucer champagne glass. Here's a close up of the view of the wine glass in terms of the coat of arms. This is an interesting grouping. Uh, we are really fortunate to have these two pieces in the museum's collection. Now this piece is, shows the first stage of cutting done by the cutter. So you can see the red lines that mark the outline of the pattern and you see the first stage of cutting called roughing. So what the first cutter has done is just cut the main lines of the pattern uh, and done them on a fairly rough basis and you can see that the stem has been cut to create the panels for the stem, and then you see the outline of the design on the foot. On this, this uh, saucer champagne, you have this little paper tag. That tag was made, was put on this piece by John Dorflinger. And what that tag says is this was an extra for the Harrison service, for the, cham for the champagne glass. So never finished, but it shows that first stage in the process. The second one, you can see the shield is still blank. All the cutting has been done. The polishing has all been done, but it was waiting for the engraving of the coat of arms. And so this piece was another factory extra, also has a Dorflinger label down on the bottom. Both of these pieces were owned by John Dorflinger and they've come down in the Dorflinger family and then got dispersed. This first one here, whoops, sorry about that. This first one was given to us by a collector, a uh, man named Paul Borelli in Florida. He bought a box of glassware. This was in the box. He asked us if we wanted it, and we said absolutely, because it shows the process of making these pieces. And then finally, at the end, you have the finished piece. This one came up at auction a few years ago, but if you go back to the inventory of John Dorflinger's glass collection when he passed away, this one and this one are both in, identified on the inventory. And then here's the finished piece. So this is what we would call a progression set. It shows you the different stages of the process in making the piece. It is pretty unusual to actually have a presidential progression set. And then here's a, a good close up of the uh, coat of arms on the saucer champagne. Brandy and soda, this is another factory extra 
that John Dorflinger saved and preserved. It has the blank shield before the coat of arms has been engraved on it. And again, here's another view of the saucer champagne that was in the previous slide. This is an interesting piece. This was also in the John and David Dorflinger collection. It is cut in Dorflinger's pattern number 210. So that's a trellis design, triple miter cut. So you see these three miter cuts on the design, the blank shield on the front of the piece. And according to David Dorflinger's article, this was the original prototype for the Harrison service not done in the Russian pattern, but this is what Dorflinger sent to the White House for approval before he produced the, uh, the Harrison set, and the Harrisons didn't like it. So they rejected this design. It's actually quite a nice design, but we suspect what did it was this row of hob these rows of hob stars going around it. So you can see at the edges how they stick out and they create kind of bumps. So probably not the most comfortable glass to hold in your hand. Uh, so that may have been the reason why it was rejected. But it's interesting as well to have an example, uh, the example of the original prototype uh, piece that was sent to the White House for that design. Now is that heavy? It is. It's fairly heavy. Yeah, a little bit heavier than the than the Russian pieces, but but not by much. The Russian pieces are relatively heavy as well, especially that big brandy and soda glass tumbler, which is about that high. Was brandy and soda a big thing? Uh, it was beginning in the early 1900s. That's the those were actually part of the reorder by President Roosevelt. Uh, so he wanted brandy and soda glasses. They weren't part of the original set, and so he ordered them at the time. So when were you drinking brandy and soda? Probably about 1907. What do you mean, at really? the dinner table? At, at, uh, yeah, 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 at the dinner table as well, yeah. Or separate from it as well, too, yeah. Okay, here is a dinner, a state dinner in the White House in 1902, February 24th, 1902. Uh, and this dinner was for Prince Henry of Prussia. So it's a wonderful example of a state dinner in the White House. You can see how opulent, almost over the top, everything was. These are gas chandeliers. You've got flower displays, uh, flowers in all of the chandeliers. You had these huge flower arrangements on the table. You have all garlands on all of the columns. Uh, and so just a really elaborate example of, uh, of a state dinner in the White House. And when you look at the place settings, what you see now by this point is that the White House is using whatever glass they have. So the color wine glasses here, there were no color wine glasses for white wine in the Harrison set. Those were in the Lincoln set. And so those are in the Lincoln design. The balance of the glassware that you see here the wine glasses, the water goblet, the champagne glass are all in the Harrison design. And you see these large table salts here. Whoops, there's another one right back over here on that side right there are in the hob diamond pattern left over from the grant service. So some pieces got left behind there as well. So by this point, they're actually mixing and matching using what is practical and appropriate to what they're serving for the steak dinner but a great example of a state dinner in the, uh, in the White House. We have a view of this uh, upstairs in our exhibit. This is John Dorflinger. Uh, so when John Dorflinger was the foreman of the cutting shop when the factory closed in 1921. And shortly after that, he purchased much of the contents of the factory from the Dorflinger children. Uh, and that included uh, all of the glassware, the production glassware. It also included equipment, cutting equipment, furniture from the factory, pieces that had been partially done but never completed. Uh, and John, to his credit, saved and preserved all of that material. Uh, and he actually opened a shop and a small museum, the very first Dorflinger Glass Museum in his father's general store. The building still exists right at the bottom of, uh, of Charles Street, just about a block away from here. Uh, and here is John in his shop, and he would sell some of the glassware as well. That's how he supported himself. But he would also show people examples of the glassware he had. Now, a lot, in fact, most of the 
White House pieces that I have been showing you are either in the White House collection or they were factory samples. And one of the smartest things from our perspective that Christian Dorflinger did is whenever he would produce a large service, a, a special order, he would keep an example of every piece in the service. And that was largely because you knew there would be breakage and there would be reorders. And it was simple to simply take the piece out of the case, hand it to his workers and say, go make 24 more exactly like this. But John Dorflinger ended up with most of the surviving factory samples. Some were uh, among Dorflinger family members as well. And many of the pieces that we exhibit and that other museums exhibit are those factory samples. There are two huge benefits from our perspective to this. Number one, most of them are in very good condition, better than the pieces in the White House that were used over time. And second, uh, we know they're Dorflinger because of the, of the lineage and how those pieces have, we can trace their ownership as they've come down the line. So these factory samples for us are, are really terrific examples. And as a result of this, uh, John saving them, some of the other Dorflinger family members saving them, and then ensuring that many of those pieces ended up in museums, we now have some wonderful examples of Dorflinger's presidential glasswork uh, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, in the Corning Museum of Glass, uh, and uh, here uh, close by, here at the Factory Museum, at the Dorflinger Glass Museum at the top of the hill, and at the Everhart Museum in Scranton. And in fact, if you look at the combination of the Factory Museum, the Glass Museum, the Everhart Museum, you probably have more White House glass pieces here in, uh, in, a, in easy distance from where we are right now uh, than anywhere else in the country other than the White House uh, and possibly the Smithsonian, which has uh, a number of examples, but they don't display them very much. Uh, so, uh, so you can see them here, and it's largely because John saved these pieces and ensured that they were taken care of and passed down uh, and, uh, and now are available for all of us to see and appreciate. What's the Everhart Museum? So uh, it is in Scranton. It is a combination. It's an art museum, but they have a wonderful Dorflinger Gallery, and they've just redone their Dorflinger Gallery. Uh, and refurbished it so it's all fresh and new. Uh, and then uh, they also have uh, a, a wildlife uh, a collection as well, lots of birds. So Dr. Everhart was really interested in uh, wildlife and in the birds. Uh, and so uh, when he uh, left the money to build the, uh, the museum, uh, it has kind of those three major collections. So a nice art collection, including lots of good regional art from this area, wonderful Dorflinger glass collection, uh, and then the birds. Yep. This is John's shop. Uh, that's his father's general store at the bottom of Charles Street. Wow. Looks a little better in those days <laughs> than it does today. Uh, here is John with two examples of the Lincoln uh, factory samples, uh, and John would have those in the safe, and if he really liked you when you came to visit, uh, he would take them out and show them to you. Here a couple of, uh, another shot of, the, of three of the White House pieces. Again, ice cream plate, goblet, and the, uh, and the cordial. All right, now engraving. Uh, we are very fortunate to at least have a copy of the engraver's notebook for Dorflinger's head engraver in 1917 to 1918. His name was Hermann Neugebauer. And uh, 1918 was the last large Dorflinger order, reorder of White House glass. And it was a reorder uh, ordered by uh, Woodrow Wilson for the Harrison service. And this engraver's notebook is terrific because it shows the work that Neugebauer did in engraving the uh, U presidential seal on every piece in the reorder. And you can see the time when he started work each day, 
and the date. So he started on September 11th. He worked all the way through the month of September. And it shows you also the pieces that he, uh, that he worked on as well. And how much time he spent to mark it and then how much time he spent engraving it. So it is just a fabulous record of the actual work done on the last presidential order done uh, by Dorflinger for the Wilson administration. And Doolin and Martin was the retailer in Washington, D.C. who handled the order, so it's listed as the, uh, the Doolin Martin order. And, uh, but you can see again the wine tumblers, the work that he did on those, and the work progressed and went all the way through November and then on into December and finishing up. Yeah. So you can see exactly how much time it took to do. It was about seven and a half hours to do each one of those coats of arms uh, and how long it took to do the engraving work on the pieces. Now, David, John and David Dorflinger had this engraver's notebook. Uh, fortunately, uh, copies were made of the notebook to show this record of the work that was done on the engraving. But unfortunately, the notebook has disappeared. Uh, so another example of something that's kind of disappeared. Hopefully it will reappear at some point uh, in the future. But at least what we have right now tells us the work that was done uh, and goes through this, uh, this last uh, important presidential reorder. And then here you can see on into January uh, as well. So about four months to do the engraving work on, the, on this order from late 1917 to early 1918. Okay, uh, John would often also go out and do talks uh, for clubs and organizations. Here's a great example where, again, he's holding an example, a factory sample of the Lincoln wine glass, and this lady is holding the ice cream plate. Uh, there are other really interesting Dorflinger pieces that you see uh, exhibited on the table here. So he would talk about Dorflinger glass and bring examples to show people. And the one I want to focus on now is that piece. So uh, the last major presidential order that Dorflinger did was for the Wilson administration in, for the Harrison service in 1917 to 1918. But this piece has a presidential connection as well, but much later. Now this piece we think was part of a set of engraved glassware that Dorflinger produced in 1917. We do not know who the set was made for, uh, but it's a wonderful example of engraving and undoubtedly Hermann Neugebauer would have been the engraver for these pieces uh, as well. And the presidential connection here is to President Kennedy. So in 1963, uh, the Pinchot uh, Mansion down in Milford was given to the United States Forest Service to create the Pinchot Institute. Uh, and that's the Forest Service's research arm. And the dedication of the Pinchot Institute was in September of 1963, and President Kennedy was invited to attend the de and uh, preside over the dedication, and he did. Uh, and so when it became known that uh, President Kennedy was coming to Milford, the Pike County Chamber of Commerce went to see John Dorflinger, and they said, we need a gift to give to President Kennedy, and John suggested that goblet. Now at the time, John thought that it was the only one. Uh, and so he sold that to the Pike County Chamber of Commerce to present to President Kennedy. Uh, the presentation was actually not made at the dedication ceremony because they hadn't pre-cleared it with the Secret Service, but the dedication was later made in Washington, literally right before the Kennedys left for Dallas. So we think oh. that it was the last gift that the Kennedys received and the last gift that Mrs. Kennedy acknowledged before the assassination. The glass got broken when uh, the Kennedy's uh, contents were removed from the White House, but it is, we believe still, uh, in the uh, Kennedy Library uh, in Boston. Since then, we have found examples from this set. So here's an example of a wine glass from the set. 
Now, um, Kurt, you can tell me when it was. Had it been 20 years ago, right? Yeah. So there was, used to be a big glass show in Silver Spring, Maryland. And a guy came into the glass show with a whole set of these wine glasses. And it's a very distinctive style in terms of the engraving and the shape. Uh, and so a number of people, including Kurt, who was there, recognized what they were. And so people were grabbing them and buying them. Uh, so Kurt bought one for himself and he bought one for Helen Barger, the uh, uh, early uh, Dorflinger collector that I mentioned. Uh, and then a number of other people bought examples as well. That had to be 30 years ago. It probably was 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah exactly. So what yeah. did that glass yeah. cost 30 years ago? I don't remember. Probably not a huge amount, but, no. <laughs> but especially since the guy didn't really know what it was. Probably 100 and a quarter. Yeah, exactly. So then uh, we went to uh, the glass show that's held up in Corning, New York in April. Oh, and this had to be about almost 10 years ago now, probably. Yeah. And lo and behold, one of the dealers had this glass in his booth. And so we bought it. And when we turned it over, you'll see a little paper label down there. It's Helen Barger's little label identifying what it was. So it's exactly the same glass that Kurt bought 30 years ago before that. So back to us now. Uh, since then, we found two goblets and another uh, wine glass as well from this set. Just a beautiful set. The engraving is really remarkable on it. Uh, it has this interesting engraving design on the sides and on the back that are very reminiscent of, a, of an engraved goblet that Dorflinger did uh, back in 1893. Uh, and uh, just a really wonderful example of engraving. If you look at the ships uh, on these pieces, they're really remarkable. The engraved water, the rigging, the flags, the pennant the, up there, uh, just a wonderful example of engraving. And the Pike County Chamber of Commerce thought this was the perfect gift to give to President Kennedy because the set was made in 1917, the year Kennedy was born, and the beautiful example of the ship, Kennedy was a sailor, so perfect, uh, perfect gift for- What uh, for, was the significance of the ship? We don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it probably related to who the set was made for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, it's almost like a galleon shape, mm -hmm. but there's an American <laughs> flag on the, on the mast. And then here's a little more close-up view of the uh, of the ship as well with the rigging. It's, it, the detail is really remarkable. And this is upstairs or no? Uh, it's not actually. We don't have it out on display right now. We've got two examples over in the uh, in the office. Yep. And so that's the last piece of Dorflinger glass that has a presidential connection. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks.